Lord, you're set apart from this world. You're above this world. Lord, you have the rights as creator. You have the rights as ruler. Lord, not only to have a standard of righteousness, Lord, but also to forgive us when we don't meet that standard. Thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, thank you for uh, your wonderful love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we pray that we would just appreciate the forgiveness that we have in you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In Spain, there was a father who had some problems with his uh, son. They had some words uh, with one another, so much so that the son uh, was decided he didn't want anything to do with the father again, and he took off. The father searched for him for months. Finally, in desperation, he put an ad in the paper uh, asking uh, for uh, his son to respond. The ad said this. It said, uh, Dear Paco, Meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. So on Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up. <laughs> Hopefully the one he wanted also showed up. But you know, we're all looking for forgiveness. Isn't that what that song's saying? Uh, we sang earlier, everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. Uh, we all need forgiveness. We're all looking for forgiveness. We're looking for a right relationship with our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And the good news is that forgiveness is available. It's available through Jesus Christ. Uh, forgiveness uh, was bought and paid for on a cross uh, many years ago so that we could have hope and we could have a future. Uh, so I, I know everybody's looking for forgiveness. I, I, I thank God that our music director's in touch with God because I couldn't have picked out better songs for this morning. God's amazing grace offers to us forgiveness for our sins. Uh, God is good uh, to us. Amen? Amen? And he loves us. Uh, I, I want you uh, to also, uh, I think sometimes we're like uh, the famous patriot, Spanish patriot called uh, Narvez. Uh, and as he lay on his uh, deathbed, his uh, uh, father asked him, he says, whether he had forgiven all his enemies. Uh, Norvez looked astonished and said, Father, I have no enemies. I have shot them all. <laughs> now that's not exactly the picture of forgiveness that we want to, <laughs> to paint today. I believe God has forgiveness for our sins. I want to share a personal story uh, with you to help you understand how important forgiveness is. My mom and dad were married 50-something years. <laughs> I forget how long exactly, but over 50 years. Much of their marriage, I should say if the last several years of their marriage, there were some conflict in the, between them. Uh, it, my dad, when he was in his early uh, 40s, Bonnie, is that right? He had the cancer, went to the hospital, or, yeah. Uh, and there in the hospital, he really got uh, his life uh, right with the Lord, and he really sought to, he perhaps came, became a little overzealous even, <laughs> but he, he really wanted to follow the Lord. He felt the Lord calling him to be a pastor. Uh, and men, I want to advise you not to do what he did. <laughs> he was Kentucky, you know, man of the house kind of guy, and, and so he came home, and he said, uh, Levina, you're going to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> that didn't go over real big, <laughs> by the way. She was a very shy Kentucky farm girl at the time and, and scared to death of something like that. He didn't give her time to pray about it, didn't give her time to think about it, but that became a wedge between the two of them. And it... I believe that it didn't get resolved until my dad was on his deathbed. I believe in flying saucers. Do you believe in flying saucers? I have seen flying saucers, flying cups, <laughs> flying silverwares. <laughs> you know, I have seen those in the house that I grew up in because there was conflict between my mom and my dad rooted in, rooted in this, this one thing 
that they hadn't forgiven each other for. On my dad's deathbed, they got it right. And it was the greatest gift my mom could have had at that time. She needed to have that relationship right to spend the next several years without my dad. She needed to know they were okay. Forgiveness is personal to me. It's personal to my family. I believe you probably have some stories like that as well, where forgiveness was given and forgiveness was offered, where, where it was received and everyone was better off because of it. Uh, we are offered forgiveness by our Lord and Savior Jesus. And I want to share with you one of the greatest stories in the Bible to illustrate that point is the story of King David. You remember King David? King David was perhaps the greatest warrior king of all of Israel. Uh, he, uh, as a young boy, uh, was brought into the kingdom by King Saul. Uh, king Saul really loved his playing of the harp, and, and he learned while he was there how a kingdom works. Uh, and soon he became uh, David and Goliath. Heard, have you heard that story? Uh, soon he became a great warrior in the army, and the, the people would say, uh, David, or Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Uh, and the heart of the people seemed to be going towards David, so Saul became very jealous. Uh, and Saul sought to end his life many, many times. He went through that, all that circumstance, believing and trusting in God, knowing that God had anointed him as a young man to be the future king, but not willing to take the kingdom from Saul, but waiting for God's timing to give the kingdom to him. Uh, and so he went through all that period of time. Much of the Psalms that we have were written by King David. Some of them are in high times and when things are good, and some of them are in low times when things are difficult. And he writes a psalm crying out to God uh, because of his special relationship with God. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. That David was a, a man that really sought God. Uh, you know, I wish it could have, the story could end on that high point. But David was also a man who committed a great sin. David, one day when he should have been with the army, when he should have been on the battlefield, when he should have been there as leader uh, of the forces, was instead in his home. If you go to Jerusalem, you'll note that David's home is up on the highest part of, of the mountain uh, there. Uh, there. Just now, they found his, uh, the ruins of, of David's palace here not too many years ago, and they're still excavating it right now and exposing it but his home l was high on the hilltop looking down on other homes and one day when he should have been at the battle when he should have been fulfilling his kingly duties instead he was at home looking down on the roofs of other houses and there was Bathsheba Bathsheba was bathing on top of the roof. If you, if you understand Middle Eastern homes, you would understand that their water supply was up there. And so it, was, it made sense. And besides that, when you were on top of the roof, nobody could see you unless you were the king in the palace. And where David should have turned his eyes and his gaze away from Bathsheba, he set his eyes on Bathsheba and lusted after her in his heart. That was sin number one. Sin number two is he sent somebody to go and get Bathsheba. They brought him, her into the palace and he took advantage of Bathsheba. And when she reported to him later that she was pregnant, then he tried to hide his sin by bringing back Uriah, her husband, uh, from the battlefield where he was fighting faithfully and as was a great soldier for David's army. And David's force. He brought him back, tried to get him over uh, two or three times, tried to get him drunk, tried to get him to go home, tried to get him to uh, think that the baby was his child in the end. Uriah, as a good soldier, said he wasn't going to go to the comfort of his home and the comfort of the arms of his wife while his fellow soldiers were on the battlefield. And so he stayed in the, at the gate uh, and and kept his virtue, kept his uh, uh, commitment to the rest of the forces. Uh, David got, realized that that wasn't going to work. So he, he sent Uriah back to the 
the uh, Job, the, uh, the leader of Israel's forces, with a note. And the note said, put Uriah in the thick of the battle. Put him by the, the walls where he is sure to be killed. And so Job did exactly what he was told. And, and sure enough, Uriah was killed that day in the battle. This doesn't sound like a man after the heart of God, does it? Sounds, sounds like a man caught in a, in a deepening cycle of sin. Believe me, sin isn't just something that happens and that's it. Sin leads to sin, leads to sin, leads to sin, and pretty soon you're falling off a cliff that you never wanted to be at, never thought you would be on. You're falling down into a deep sin. David didn't even realize this. He thought he had covered things up. He thought he had hidden his sin. Uh, he took Bathsheba after the period of mourning. He took Bathsheba to be his wife. And now the child was going to be born to him uh, that he had fathered uh, through Bathsheba. And everything was going to be fine. You know, when we're in that condition where we think we can sin and get away with it, we're in serious trouble. We're in serious trouble. We need to recognize where we're at. God loved David. And so he didn't leave David in that sinful state. He sent his prophet, Nathan. And we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we read it? 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and, and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. You know, that may be like your pet dog, you know, <laughs> today. Uh, now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock of his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely this man has, who has done this deserves to die. And he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed, appointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Remember that phrase a little bit later. I would have added many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household, I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. He shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house, and then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. 